All right, guys, what's going on? Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about cheat meals and refeeds, and then we're going to kind of be comparing and contrasting the two, and then kind of going over which one I believe is the the best option given the given a specific scenario. Okay, so so if you're watching this, then there, there's a good there's a good chance that the reason that you're watching this video is because you're you're in a dieting phase and you either feel like you need or want, which are, are two different things. Uh, I won't go into that too much today. Um, but feeling like you you need or you want a cheat meal or a refeed, and you're probably trying to decide which one of these should I implement uh, for myself. And so hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to uh, to have an answer to that question. So you'll be able to know which, which plan that you take. By the way, hopefully like as I'm moving around, my uh, my table is not very sturdy, so hopefully my my camera's not moving all over the place. All right, first things first. Let's define each of these. Let's define a refeed and let's define a cheat meal. So since we have that that basis of of information, we'll be able to kind of kind of continue on from there. So a refeed is what I consider a strategic increase of of calories uh, through specific food sources. Um, predominantly as we increase the, the calories, we're going to be doing th so through carbohydrates. And I'll, I'll be talking about why we, we're using carbohydrates as we, as we go on. And then a cheat meal is going to be any plan uh, or any form of off-plan eating. So that's eating something that isn't on your, isn't on your plan, uh, something like a burger with fries or pizza, ice cream, something along that, something along that sort. So now that we kind of have a basic definition for the both of those, uh, I think it's really important that we understand why these are implemented in a, in a caloric deficit phase and what is the purpose of these. Like we don't just throw these refeeds in randomly and sporadically. We don't just throw cheat meals in uh, randomly and sporadically. They do serve a purpose. And again, hopefully this is going to help you decide if, if this is something that's, that's necessary. So there are multiple reasons why you would you would want to intermittently increase your your calories specifically through carbohydrates when you're going through a dieting period. The first is that we know if we're in a caloric deficit for an, an extended period of time, specifically a very harsh caloric deficit, like one where we we've made a very deep caloric pull and we're we're in a in a pretty large and significant caloric deficit. I'm not talking three, four, five hundred calories here. I'm talking. 800 calories plus, like a very significant, we're, we're really digging here for fat loss. After a, a period of dieting, now this is generally takes about six to eight weeks to, to, to onset, we're going to start to get some negative adaptations to our hormonal panel. Uh, our, our metabolism is going to slow down in layman's terms. Specifically, uh, our cortisol is going to increase, which is our body's stress hormone. We're going to have a decreased uh, conversion of T4 to T3. Those are our thyroid hormones. So our body will be producing less thyroid and our, our thyroid will be less active. If you're unaware, your thyroid is a gland that's in your throat uh, that specifically stimulates your body's metabolism and all of its metabolic processes. Uh, our leptin is going to be elevated and our ghrelin is going to be decreased. So real quick, those, those two hormones, leptin and ghrelin, those are really important to understand. Leptin is what we call the hunger hormone and ghrelin is what we call the satiety hormone. So leptin being the, the hunger hormone, that, that's the hormone that your body sends to your brain. I'm hungry. I need to eat more food. And ghrelin is the hormone that's secreted as we're eating that tells your brain, I'm no longer hungry. I'm full. We can stop eating now. So leptin and ghrelin, you, you can start to see as your leptin rises and your ghrelin decreases, you're going to kind of be in a permanent state of hunger because the hormone that, that makes you feel hungry is, is constantly high. It, it's elevated beyond normal. And then uh, while we're eating, the, the hormone ghrelin that, that tells our body we're full, we need to stop eating is decreased in large amounts. So we're constantly getting the signal that we're hungry and we're never really getting the signal that we're full. So we're going to constantly be hungry if, if when we're in a, in a caloric deficit. 
specifically the longer that we go in. And that's that really has very little to do with with the amount of food that we're eating. Uh, I hear from people all the time who in, in like their peak off season, they're eating 7,000 calories or so. And when they're dieting, they're eating 4,500 calories. And for most people, if they were able to get shredded on 4,500 calories, that would be an absolute dream. But for those people, 4,500 calories, they're, they're they're hungry as hell eating 4,500 calories in a deficit. And that's just because there's, there's hormonal adaptations that take place when we're in a caloric deficit. Um, the next, the next reason that we would use something like a cheat meal or a refeed is it, it's more of a, an adherence tool. So this is where you're going to see more with, with what I call general population clients. These are just people that you see, um, in, in the gym every day, they don't compete, they don't really lift, they, they just want to lose weight for, for health purposes. So this, this type of cheat meal approach is, is a good approach to help increase the, the adherence. I know me specifically when I started um, in the gym four years ago now, uh, from 2015 to 2016, I had a 110 pound weight loss. I went from 200 and 58 pounds to about 149 pounds in a year. So I lost 110 pounds in 12 months. The one of the ways that as I, I got started doing that is I gave myself a little reward system. And I, I starting off, I let myself um, every five pounds that I lost, I would give myself some form of a cheat meal. And then as that progressed, and I got more and more okay with um, with being eating healthier and, and making smarter choices, I increased that to every 10 pounds. Um, but that was just a, a simple way that I know, and I know for most people, myself individually, when I, when I first got started, it's, it's very hard to, to stick to a plan long term, knowing that the foods that you like, you, you may, uh, I don't want to say you'll never be able to eat them again, but it, it's far less sporadic than what you're used to. So giving yourself a reward system is kind of a way to tell yourself like, hey, I can, I can suffer through this next, you know, four days because in four days I, I get some sort of relief through a cheat meal um, or I've only got two pounds to go until I lose a cheat meal. How, however way you set it up as, as a coach or if you're the, you're the individual, it doesn't really matter. But the main purpose of, of the cheat meal is that it's kind of a reward system and it's a way to keep you on track. We know through... Um, through research and just kind of how the brain works in general, that we were actually more susceptible to, to sticking to a plan the more that we reward ourselves for the progress that we made. It makes us want to want to stick to the plan more and get more of those rewards and all those kinds of things. I'm, I'm not a fucking psychology major, um, but it's, it's just a basic reward system is, is the, main, the main concept of, of cheat meals. So now that we've we've kind of gone over both of those two things, I think it's really important to backtrack to that that six to eight week mark. I think if you're starting in a diet, whether you're a, a physique athlete or a strength athlete or a competitor, or whether you're a general population client, I think it's really important that you give yourself anywhere from from four to eight weeks where you don't have any form of, of a refeed or you don't have any form of a cheat meal. Because the reality of the situation is, is while these things are aimed to kind of reverse those adaptations, those adaptations take a lot longer to set in than a lot of people think. So a lot of people, the first weekend they'll die in their diet, they'll be wanting a cheat meal or a refeed. And at that point, it's just blatantly unnecessary. And you're giving yourself a, a reason to, to cheat or, or eat more food that you really don't need. So I think it's really important that we need to have a basis where you need to be anywhere from, from four to eight weeks to allow those negative adaptations to take place so that this refeed or this cheat meal actually has merit and it's not just you're eating food to, to satisfy a craving. So what are the similarities in, in each of these approaches? Well, obviously at base level, both of these are, are caloric um, increases uh, and they'll, they'll provide hormonal benefits if your body is in a deteriorated state hormonally. And they'll also provide satiety benefits. If you've got certain foods that are, that you're really on your mind, like for whatever reason, you've been thinking about Ben and Jerry's for the past five days. Sometimes getting that Ben and Jerry's is, is in your system is good to help kind of relieve that craving. And both are uh, a momentary mental break. 
from the diet. Um, but other than that, those are really kind of the two similarities between these two approaches. Both of these approaches are, in my opinion, they're, they're very different. And there's, there's a lot of differences between each approach and which one that you decide to take individually. So what are the, uh, what are the benefits in each approach? Let, let's talk about the benefits. We're going to talk about refeeds. We're going to talk about cheat meals. What are the good things about each one of these? So refeeds are going to allow for more precision when we're trying to hit certain macro intakes. As you increase your carbohydrates, you can adjust your fats down. You can adjust your proteins down uh, to accommodate the, the increased carbohydrates. So if you have a certain caloric goal that you're wanting to hit and you really want to maximize the amount of carbohydrates that you're hitting within those in that caloric goal, you can adjust the fats and the proteins accordingly. Um, I'm not, this video isn't really going to be too much on, on how to set up an effective refeed that may be a different video for a different day. Um, but it, it's more or less, you have a lot of flexibility with, with where you can adjust your, your fats and your, your proteins to accommodate those carbs. Uh, refeeds are generally focused on, on keeping your digestion intact and optimal. So on a refeed, you're not really going to be eating a lot of greasy fast food. There's not going to be burgers and fries or ice cream or any of those things. What, what you're more than likely going to be doing in a refeed is you're going to be taking the same carb sources that you've been eating, rice, potatoes, oatmeal, and uh, just eating more of those. And then refeeds can, uh, if you're a competitor, a competitor in the, uh, in the scope of a contest prep, a refeed can give a rough, a rough estimation as to how many carbs are needed to, to fill you out. So when you get to that point where you're a couple days out from the stage and you're flat and you're depleted, uh, if that's the course that your that your coach is is taking you is depleting you before your show, and you you want to have a rough estimation. Okay, I need to eat about seven hundred and fifty grams of carbohydrates in order to go from from flat to full. If you haven't had a trial run of that through your diet through refeeding then you really are just kind of guessing on how many grams of carbs that you need in order to, to fill out. So that's, that's another way to look at a refeed is you're just kind of practicing the carb up situation uh, for before you step on stage. And refeeds, in my opinion, they can also be more satiating because you're not eating a lot of greasy fast food like burgers, fries, ice cream, pizza. You're just eating more clean food. I feel like Personally, for me, that helps with the the satiety part. When I'm really, really hungry, I would rather eat. And I know for some people this is kind of contradictory, and they would think the opposite. When I'm really, really hungry, I don't really necessarily want to eat a burger and fries and eat a bunch of shit. I would I would rather feel more satiated by eating more rice, more oatmeal, more potatoes, more bread, whatever, etc. Um, for cheat meals, benefits of a cheat meal. The, the main benefit of the cheat meal, just right off the bat, is that they, they give the client a mental break. They know that they have been pushing for a while and they know that there's that kind of that light at the end of the tunnel where they get they get a reward. And then the other the other main benefit of a cheat meal is that it's the the reward system. And again, this is this is very applicable with with general population people. If you're, uh, if you know that you have a reward system in place where you're rewarding yourself for the progress that you've made, it's more than likely going to make you, uh, more likely to stick to the plan and, and not be able to cheat. So now what are the, uh, what are the negatives for each approach? So I think the, the main negative for a refeed is if you implement a refeed type strategy and you're not a competitor or you're not somebody who has an extreme physique goal to get really lean, whatever. That is kind of, um, how do I want to say it? That's a very boring process. If, if you don't have a competitive goal that you're chasing towards, being able to stay robotic and being able to stay completely off on plan and, and not go off plan and not eat burger, fries, ice cream, pizza, whatever, uh, that's, that's kind of boring. So what that what that can kind of set you up for is uh, is a post diet rebound, because you've gone say sixteen weeks without eating pizza, fries, ice cream, burgers, whatever. Your your food focus on eating those things post diet 
could potentially be higher. And so the way that you rebound out of that diet could be much more aggressive because you've gone 16 weeks without eating those things. So you may be more, more likely to set up for, for a binge. Speaking of binges, I think this is really where the main negatives of, of the cheat meal approach kind of, kind of rear their ugly head. And that's the fact that if the client does not have self-control and they don't have discipline, a cheat meal can very quickly spiral out of control into a cheat day or multiple cheat meals or multiple cheat days type of thing. So if, if you tell all your client you can go have a cheat meal and they go to have a burger and fries, then a burger and fries, if the, the client has no self-control, a burger and fries can very easily lead to a burger and fries with a couple beers and ice cream after, and then they go home and then they eat cereal and candy and ice cream and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's kind of uh, by far the biggest negative of, of the cheat meal approach in the, in the sense that if, if the person isn't robotic and it's important to understand, especially as, as, as us people that are in the bodybuilding community, we, we tend to be really robotic. Like, like me, myself personally, I've had one cheat meal in the past six weeks. I'm dieting right now and I don't, it doesn't really bother me. Like I don't, I don't really crave anything. It, it, it isn't that big of a, big of a deal, but I understand that that's in the minority. Like I'll, I'll, the majority of people, 95 to 99% of the people, like they can't go six weeks without having a cheat meal. They just, they just mentally can't handle that. And we have to understand that in the bodybuilding community that we are the exception to the rule. So just because that we're robotic and we can, we can stick to a plane without cheating, that doesn't mean that a lot of, of other people can do the same. So if you tell a bodybuilder to go out and have a cheat meal and you say just a burger and fries, like more often than not, if, if they're a good bodybuilder, um, they'll, they'll stick to the plan and they won't deviate from it. But if you get somebody who's just a soccer mom and she had a really stressful week at work and you tell her to go have a burger and fries with her husband, and then that can very quickly lead into, into other things. So by far the biggest negative of the cheat meal is its potential to, to completely spiral out of control. Next, another big benefit of, or excuse me, not benefit, uh, negative of the cheat meal approach is its effect on digestion. So if, if you're going out and you're eating, I, I keep using the same foods, burger, fries, pizza, ice cream, those kind of foods, just because those are kind of the main ones. Um, they can tend to cause a lot of GI distress. Um, and this is more applicable again for bodybuilders, but if you have a training session the next day, then that's kind of a big, a big problem. If you, if you've got digestive issues, I think it was Evan Senapani that I heard where Evan Senapani was talking about cheat meals and he wants you to go out and have something good. But if you eat a cheat meal and it makes you shit your pants during training legs the next day, then it was more of a negative than it was a positive. So we need to keep the, the digestive focus of, of the, the client, the athlete intact fully. And obviously, as you would assume, burger, fries, pizza, ice cream are not the best foods for digestion. And so there's potential where eating those things can trigger um, IBS-like systems, symptoms, excuse me, a lot of problems with digestion, which could affect training, which just kind of has a, a negative uh, downhill spiral from there. And then another one is that cheat meals have potential to overshoot your caloric targets if, if, if they're overdone, which can lead to fat gain. I, I, a firm believer, excuse me, that if, if you execute a cheat meal properly and you execute a refeed properly, there is no fat gain. Um, I can kind of in a, maybe in a separate video go over again how to how to structure those things and kind of the ins and outs as to why you shouldn't be gaining fat on a cheat meal or a refeed, but that'll be a different video for a different day. I don't want to go too off topic on this one. Um, but if, if you go and you have one of those binge attacks, then that can very easily overshoot a caloric target and you can very easily store body fat from that, which is just, it's it's a step backwards. And a lot of people are going to say that a cheat meal or a refeed, if you do it during your diet phase, like it is kind of taking a step backwards to, to take two steps forward. 
Um, but I am a firm believer that in, in most occasions, it's not actually a step backwards at all. It's just kind of hitting the pause button for a brief second and then to kind of get everything recharged and then, and then go forwards from there. So that's another big, uh, negative of the, of the cheat meal approach, obviously way more negatives with the cheat meal approach than the refeed approach, in my opinion. Um, so anyways, now that we kind of have the basis of, of, of information, let's talk about which approach is the best. Ultimately, this is going to come down to the person and the situation that we're in. If you're a competitor in a contest prep situation, you mentally need to switch off from the thought of eating burgers, fries, pizza, ice cream, and you need to be 100% focused on the goal because contest prep is very, very fucking hard. And if, if you're focused on what you're going to eat post-show and not winning, which is why you're competing in the first place is because you're a competitor and you want to win, then, then your head is not in the right place. And I think you need to reevaluate why you're competing and, and what you want to get out of, out of the competing process. Uh, refeeds are almost always going to be better in the, in the contest prep scenario. Um, and even for those that don't compete, those that are in, say they want to get to 8% body fat for the beach. Now that's, that's kind of below most people's genetic set points. So that's what I would consider just an extreme physique goal. Like you, you need to be a little bit more structured when you're trying to, to reach a goal for that. So I do think in that situation, a refeed would be better than the cheat meal. The refeeds are going to give you more biofeedback, especially if you're uh, you're a competitor. They're going to help keep your digestion intact. I believe that they're more beneficial to to glycogen replenishment, as the types of carbohydrates that you're going to be eating aren't sugary garbage like what would most be in a cheat meal. They're going to be whole food sources: rice, potatoes, oatmeal, etc. And we can maximize the intake of those carbohydrates. Because we can adjust our fats and proteins downwards in order to accommodate more carbohydrates and help keep digestion intact. If you're a general population client or somebody who's just dieting from, I don't know, 25% body fat, they want to get to 15 or 10%, I think the cheat meal approach will suffice for most people. It's going to potentially help you to, to stick to the plan more, kind of help you again with that reward system thing. It's going to give you a mental break. You're not eating chicken and broccoli all the time. It'll give you a, a chance to enjoy something, give you a chance to, to be social with, with family and, and again, just be able to help stick to the, to the plan. Now, all of those things can be mitigated if the cheat meal tends to spiral out of control. So it's important to understand that while you're eating a cheat meal, there still needs to be some form of self-discipline. You can't just go eat as if you're never going to eat another meal again in your life. That's completely irresponsible and that's going to reverse all of the progress that you made from the diet and it's going to completely mitigate all of the all of the positive benefits that the, the cheat meal will provide. All right, guys, hope you liked the video. If you like it, drop a thumbs up. If you're interested in coaching, coaching email is in the, the description below. Take it easy.